Special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics' mission at horizontherapeutics.com. You learn like we all do when we're dealing with kids in general, but when we're dealing with people with special needs is you learn infinite patience or hopefully you learn infinite patience. You know, it's harder sometimes than others, but you know, it's just the understanding that even though things that, that he's doing that may seem defiant or may seem like he's just picking on you, you know, he's just doing things to, to get a rise out of you. It, it are things that he just has no control over. That's our guest this week, Chris Brewster, the father of three kids, two of which have special needs, 16-year-old Bowie, who has Angelman syndrome, and 26-year-old Seth, who has scleroderma, is autistic, and is currently undergoing gender transition. We'll hear the story of Seth and his family this week on the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Here now is our host, David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. So now let's hear this intriguing conversation between Chris Brewster and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Chris Brewster of Waverly, New York, who's the director at Brewster Marketing Solutions, the father engagement coordinator for Parent to Parent in New York State, and the father of three, to whom have special needs. Chris, thank you for taking the time to do a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. You and your wife, Kristen, have been married for six years and are the proud parents of three, son Bowie, 16, who has Angelman syndrome, daughter Ada, 17, and son Seth, 26, who has scleroderma, which is also known as short leg syndrome, autism, and more recently is undergoing gender transition. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Waverly. We actually are living in the house across the street from the house I grew up in where my dad still lives. (laughs) So I'm one of those people who was raised here, left, and then came back and stayed. So my recollection was that uh, you have a number of brothers. Where are you in the pecking order? I do. I have four brothers. I am second. My oldest brother lives in Hilton Head, South Carolina. The next one, the youngest to me, is in Mount Kisco, New York, uh, north of New York City. Then the fourth one is in New Jersey, and the youngest is in Connecticut. Okay. So you guys have all stayed on the East Coast? For the most part. My oldest brother has lived in Texas. He's lived in Chicago. He's moved to South Carolina to be close to his oldest and his soon-to-be five grandchildren. Oh, my. Okay. That's exciting. Well, um, speaking of uh, parenting, I'm wondering, um, what did your dad do for a living? Uh, He was a history teacher at the local high school for 30 years. Does he still live in the house across the street? He does. (laughs) Just turned 89 in August. Still out cleaning the sidewalk and mowing the lawn and doing all the things around the house that he doesn't let me help him with. Well, it maybe has uh, contributed to his longevity, right? That uh, he's out there staying healthy and exercising and keeping up with things. It absolutely has. He actually still volunteers at least three days a week in addition to what he does with his church. What type of volunteering does he do? He runs the local food pantry and he helps in the office with a uh, local church organization that helps to collect and distribute um, furniture to people who need it. That's fabulous. So I'm sort of curious now, how would you describe your relationship with your dad? Better now, my dad is very quiet. I grew up in a household where my mom was kind of the boss. She was the one who established the discipline and 
let my dad meet it out. She was the one who was more boisterous and outgoing. My dad was always very, very quiet, serious, kind of matter of fact. As he's gotten older, you know, my mom passed uh, about 12 years ago, but as he's gotten older and I've gotten to know him better from just the proximity and, and close relationship, he's funny. You know, he's he's a very interesting guy. He's incredibly smart. You know, as a, a being a history teacher, he's a history buff. He reads constantly. So it's, it's very interesting to have conversations with him. My parents were both very, very active politically when I was growing up, something that I always had around me. And he's very, still very interested in that. I think some of that is from the history and some of it is just, you know, he's interested in current events as well. So he's sharp as a tack and it's great to be able to still have those conversations with him at almost 90. He's a little slower physically. He gets around a little bit. Um, less quickly than he did, but as far as mentally, he's, he's still right there. And it's great to see. That's fabulous. So uh, when you think about your dad, I'm wondering if there's an important takeaway or two, a lesson learned that comes to mind. He was very, like I said, because he was quiet and because he really kind of deferred to my mom a lot, the things he would say would maybe carry a little bit more weight, if that makes sense. Because when people don't say as much, when they do finally speak, you maybe pay attention a little bit more. He was very encouraging in his own way. They both were, you know, when I would get good grades, I wouldn't get a pat on the back and a congratulations, great job. It was always a, we knew you had it in you, what took you so long type of reaction. And so <laughs> they were very much um, the type who wanted us, I, I feel like they, the best way to say it is they wanted us to be self-motivated. They wanted us to not necessarily need their or anyone else's approval for the things that we do and to recognize ourselves, you know, that our, our strengths and our abilities to do what we need to do. And I feel like that's, that was effective, you know, with both of them. I feel like that did help with all of us in, in really kind of pushing uh, some independence. Yeah, well, if I can paraphrase, I think what you've said is that they had high expectations for you, right? So that you'd reach your full potential. And I had this sort of uh, thought that I haven't had for decades, uh, but there was a tagline for an investment company called EF Hutton. And the tagline was when EF Hutton speaks, everyone listens, right? So they weren't putting out messages all the time, but you know, the messages were far and few between. So you paid attention. And sort of what I heard you saying is that your dad might not have been um, overly verbal, but when he did talk, you know, you paid attention to what he had to say. Yeah, I would say that's accurate, Des. So I'm thinking about the education. You took an associate's degree from Corning Community College and then a BS in communications from State University of New York at uh, Brockport. Where was your career pointing as a young guy? I actually went to the University of Buffalo for the first two and a half years of my college. And my plan initially was that I was going to be a lawyer. Um, oh. It was one of the needs. Well, I'm good at arguing. I'm good at talking. Why would I not do something that? What kind of nip that in the bud was going to a school with 30,000 students and everything being open until four o'clock in the morning and being away from home for the first time and having way too many distractions. <laughs> and that was not conducive to law school grades. We'll put it that way. And I had been writing for my local newspaper covering sports since I was a junior in high school. It was something that I was good at. I didn't really realize until I was older that it's not something everyone's good at. It's actually a skill that a lot of people don't have. Um, and so at that point, I decided that I might as well do something that I enjoy, that I'm good at, and that I can get paid for. I started out in my newspaper career covering sports and uh, did a little bit of everything until I got out of that and, and moved more into the kind of the marketing PR end of things. Excellent. So I'm sort of curious to know, um, how did you and uh, Kristen meet? Um, she was a clerk at the local library that I was the director of for six and a half years. So she was technically an employee. Yeah, it was one of those. Okay. One of those that okay. you hear about workplace romance things. I love it. Uh, I think that's oftentimes where, you know, if you don't meet somebody in school, 
you know, it seems more likely that you're going to get to know somebody through, you know, what you spend most of your time at work and volunteering. So let's switch gears and talk about uh, special needs, first on a personal level and then beyond. Since you have a couple of kids that uh, have different abilities, I thought uh, we'd talk about them individually as opposed to just as a group. Let's start with uh, Seth, who's 26. And I'm sort of wondering before Seth's situation or diagnosis, did you and your first wife have any exposure to the special needs community? I had none at all. Nobody in my family that I knew of, nobody in my close circle that had either any special needs or had kids with special needs at that point. So when we got the diagnosis of scleroderma, it started out as a, a kind of like a rash on, on his leg. You know, I'll explain if I do slip pronouns, I will try my best. But Seth was born Rachel and is currently starting to transition to male and, and prefers to, uh, to be referred to as Seth. So... I'm proud of him and his journey and his the, the struggle that it's been and will be for him. And, and it, it takes a very strong person to to do that. And so I, you know, I, I honor and respect that and, and try as much as I can to keep the pronouns straight. But yeah, when, when he was about two and a half, we noticed a hardening, a uh, hard spot that we went to dermatologist and they actually had somebody that we saw locally who had seen this in textbooks when he was in medical school. So he referred us to another hospital. They took a skin graft and they diagnosed it as scleroderma. Typically scleroderma can present itself one of two ways. And in him, it was an exterior one, which is the hardening of tissue. Uh, On one of his legs, the tissue got really hard. The growth stopped. Uh, His one leg is about an inch and a half shorter than the other one. His foot is about two sizes smaller. So there are some definitely some physical difficulties that he went through from a very, very young age. He still has a lift put on the bottom of one shoe so he can have that evening of his stride. But, you know, it, it's just the, the lack of strength in one leg versus the other and how just that uneven walking affects hip and knee and things like that. So it's nothing that he really would talk much about, but definitely a physical pain threshold that again i i you know as, as i'm getting older and aches and pains from years of sports i can feel it a little bit but i can't imagine growing up with that constantly you know, that was something that he really kind of just powered through so is there a treatment for scleroderma or is it just something you have to make adjustments for like you were saying if one leg is longer than the other you know the lift if it's different shoe sizes Unfortunately, it sounds like you have to buy two pairs of shoes, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's both really. I mean, outside of doing surgery and putting a a metal rod in his leg to lengthen it to the size of the other one or cutting the tendon in his, you know, in his foot to uncurl the toes that had gotten curled in because they hadn't grown in sufficiently. There's nothing you can do for that. Now, typically juvenile scleroderma, like the, like what he had is pretty much by the age of 12 or 13, it's run its course. It's not going to get any worse. And and that's right about the age. I think he was about 13 when we were able to stop, but there's a steroid treatment. He took steroids for a while. And then there was another medication that he took as well that uh, was supposed to do a little bit of immunosuppressant to keep that disease from spreading. And I don't know, I'm assuming it, it did what it was supposed to because After the initial issues, it really didn't get worse. It just kind of hung on there until it cleared up. But unfortunately, at that point, the damage was done in terms of what it did to his leg, what it did to the foot, um, and then just the musculature and and even the fat. You know, it's it's uh, bottom half of his left leg is is pretty much skin and bone. That's just you know the insidiousness of some of these diseases is it's just it it leaves the after effects and you just never know what it's going to do. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. And uh, where did the autism uh, diagnosis come in? I think it's something that's always been there. You know, there, there's been some serious anxiety issues. His senior year of high school, he did online because the, just the noise and the chaos of being in the school atmosphere was, was too much for him to really deal with. And his grades suffered from that. And 
I feel like those two things were probably interrelated the entire time. But I think because they knew that there was anxiety there, there was no real push to go deeper to see if there was something else there. Um, so that's pretty recent. I mean, I think that's within probably the last couple of years that he let me know that his therapist had decided that there was also an autism component to that. Yeah, well, it's not unusual that autism is not diagnosed, you know, at age two or three. Many adults are, you know, coming to the realization that they have certain traits that would be associated with autism or just a straight up diagnosis of autism. You know, it's not like you take a pill or you do something and it goes away. It's not a disease, right? It's just part of who you are. And um, I got schooled a little bit uh, more recently. We've always uh, been taught, at least I've always been taught to use the person first language, right? You know, in the world of disability. I was talking with uh, Dr. Eric Endrick he said, well, I'm an autistic man, not a man with autism. I said, well, doesn't that go against the sort of rule of thumb about person first language? And he said, well, that might be the case with other um, afflictions, but uh, you know, he's done a lot of research um, uh, with adults with autism. And he says that 80% of adults with autism prefer to be referred to as an autistic person, not a person with autism. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I, I think it's just a refresher that uh, you need to understand what somebody's preference is, right? And make sure that you're, you're not being offensive and uh, listening to you know, who they are and you know, what's important to them. And like you said earlier, you know, I'm gonna try to get the pronouns straight, right? You know, so you wanna be respectful. That's what I think I heard you saying so that you know, you're being consistent in your reference to who you're talking about. And I think there does tend to be a tendency in a lot of cases where people don't, they don't go to the source. You know, the best way to find out how certain people feel about certain things is to ask them, you know, no matter what it is. And I, I think people just, I don't know if it's, they don't feel comfortable doing that. You know, you don't want to go up to somebody and say, what am I supposed to call you? What do you prefer I call you? But, you know, right down to it grassroots. I mean, that's the best way to find out how to do that without offending or saying something that, that you shouldn't say. So, you know, it's, it's good that there are people out there who feel comfortable enough with that to say, no, I would prefer that you refer to me that way. Yeah. I think I've heard it said it's the JAT philosophy. It's the just ask them philosophy, <laughs> which, uh, yeah. You know, you just have to be a, a little bit more intentional when you're having a conversation with somebody. So um, what, what's what been Seth's greatest challenge? It's, it's hard to say, and I don't know really where it comes from. I think it's, it's just been lack of direction isn't the right term. It's never been comfortable in school. It's never been an atmosphere or a, a, anything that he's felt like that's his place. So he's really struggled with now that he's out of school, what's next? And kind of, you know, bounce from job to job and, you know, certain things that are easier for him to do based on the physical limitations. You know, he had a position that he liked with a company he liked, but he needed to be on his feet. And eventually it just wasn't going to work. And so he had to leave that and he was very disappointed with that. And I think that's really kind of been the main thing is just finding the fit. And that might be part of, you know, we've not had this conversation in detail. He, he actually lives in Texas. So we talk on the phone, we text. I, I haven't seen him in three years, I think, just before the pandemic. So a little bit longer. I, I would think that that might be part of the gender reassignment and, and feeling comfortable with himself. I don't get the sense that he's ever really felt comfortable with who he is or what his place is. And so I think he is looking at this at least as an opportunity to maybe feel a little bit more like this is who I am. And maybe once I get this part straightened out, it, the rest of it, you know, rest will kind of fall into place. And we do everything we can from our end to help. But again, we're, you know, half a country away and it's, it's difficult sometimes to really help with, uh, with a lot of that stuff. But, you know, I'm hoping that it, very enthusiastic about it. And it seems to be something that he's, he's really passionate about making this step and doing this. So, you know, nothing bad from that, you know, that that's all just the fact that he's got himself in a place where he feels that good about it. 
you know, hopefully that translates to other things that maybe he struggled with a little bit. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, being so open and transparent about that. I think a lot of young people has nothing to do with uh, gender transition or autism or scleroderma specifically, even though those are things that uh, you made reference to. But I think that um, uh, individuals, you know, young and old for that matter, you know, are concerned with their identity. You know, where do I fit in or what do other people think? And, you know, that's human nature, right? That's not a diagnosis. That's just, you know, being human. And um, I think the sooner that we can each get to a point where we feel like we're in a good place and comfortable with who we are, maybe we're less concerned with what other people think or what other people say for that matter, right? But that's easier to say than do, right? And um, I think what I hear you saying is that while you might not have seen each other recently, it's super important to keep those lines of communication open. And whether it's by text or Zoom or phone or whatever means of communication you have, I think that uh, that's just critically important in the circumstance. It is, you know, and, and it's it's always something, you know, with him, we split when he was four and up until I think 17, you know, he, he was either with his mom half the time with me half the time. And then at that point, he was with me full time until he moved to Texas. So I, and, you know, he was with me full time for about four years and we've always had a very, very close relationship various reasons that we don't really need to get into that, uh, you know, he kind of butted heads with his mom a little bit. And there was some friction there when he was younger that fortunately at this point seems to have resolved itself. But I was a single parent for a long time with him. And I hope that I helped to bring some, some stability to what was going on and to help him at least a little bit with, with some difficult things because it's hard. I mean, life is hard. And, and especially when you don't feel like you necessarily fit in, like you said, it's hard at whatever age you're at until you really get to a place where you feel comfortable in your own skin to say, this is who I am and not identify yourself by your job. You're going to be known in your circle, your family, your friends. And how do you want to be known is not necessarily by what job you did, but that you were a good friend, that you were a good brother, that you were a good parent. It's just, it's finding whatever that is that makes you feel good about yourself and, and identifying that way. And that's not easy for any age. Everyone struggles with that. Absolutely. Well, let's switch gears and talk about uh, Bowie. So what is Bowie's diagnosis and how did it come about? Uh, Bowie has Angelman syndrome, which is a genetic disorder, a chromosomal thing. There is a, a chromosome that is dormant on the father's side. And if it's missing on the mother's side, then they just don't have it. There's been some research to try to see if there's a way to restore that either from turning it on on the father's side or from adding it. But it leads to developmental delays, motor skills, issues, different levels, obviously, like there is for anything. Bowie does say a few words, but he's technically nonverbal. He can walk, but it's not easy for him to do so, and especially not for long distances. You know, sleep is hard, and impulse control really doesn't exist. There's no fear. You know, sticking your hand in a hot pan isn't something that's going to, you're going to think I'm going to burn myself. You just want to grab the food out of there or jumping in the water without life vest or somebody there to watch you. It's just, you want to get in the water. So, in a lot of respects, it's like dealing with a three-year-old who, in our case, is five foot three and weighs 110 pounds, which, you know, he's bigger than his mom. That presents its own issues. But he was diagnosed at about two and a half. He was having seizures. He was having seizures. They were having a difficult time diagnosing it locally. So his mom and her parents took him to a uh, larger hospital and they were able to diagnose to a level where they did genetic some genetic testing and they came up with a with an angelman um, deletion positive uh, is, is the, the designation for that so you mentioned that um, bowie is technically nonverbal, limited mobility so some of the challenges include sleep and then just the sort of craziness that goes on without a uh, full understanding or appreciation for the danger or fear that, you know, we build up, you know, just from experience. What have been 
greatest challenges to being a parent of somebody with Angelman? It's uh, for me, it, honestly, it was it was getting educated on what exactly it was that we were going to be dealing with day to day, which it's easy to say, but impossible to do because it changes every day. You know, there's no stability, you know, it, it's, it's something different. It's a different behavior or a different version of behavior almost every day. When his mom and I met and started seeing each other, I knew what he was like. I knew his diagnosis. I'd been around him some, but there's a difference between seeing somebody and he's cute. He's giving you hugs. He's kissing you, you know, and then when you're living with it every day and it's, he's not sleeping, he's, you know, throwing his food around, he's having yelling fits. He's, you know, when, when we first started seeing each other and then moved in together and I was around Bowie before we got married, he was maybe 60, 65 pounds, you know, and he's 50 pounds heavier than that now. So at that point, if we needed him someplace and he didn't want to go, you just pick him up and carry him. Well, that's not really going to happen now. You know, I'm, I'm 6'2 and I weigh 185 pounds and I'm pretty solid, but I'm still not picking up a 5'3", 115 pound kid very easily and getting him someplace. It just doesn't happen. So I think to answer the question simply, it's a complex question, but I guess the simplest answer I can give is, we need to anticipate everything that we know he might do and everything that we don't know he might do. We need to be prepared for any behavior that could come about. Take him to a restaurant. He could be perfect and sit and eat his food and, and, or he could slide down under the table and refuse to come out because he doesn't want to be there anymore. You know, we never know. And it could be something in between. So we need to be prepared. I guess we, we'd say, you know, prepare for the worst. And then hopefully we're surprised. An easy way to go through just day to day life. But that's what we get. We'll be back with more of the conversation on the special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast in just a few moments. But first, this quick message. Please help 21st Century Dads gather research on families raising children with special needs by having them complete the Special Fathers Network Early Intervention Parents Survey. A link to the survey can be found in the show notes. As a token of our appreciation, each person, mom or dad, who completes the survey will receive a great dad coin. Thank you. Now, back to the conversation. You know, in in a lot of cases, it's impulse control. You know, at a certain point, everybody learns impulse control and they learn appropriate behavior for their environment. And he's not able to do that. So what we might see as being, well, how come he doesn't understand that when he's here, he can't do that? It's like, because he's not able to. Even knowing that and even being around him every day, you still sometimes that things happen where you're just amazed that it's just one more thing that you didn't realize it. It just he just has no concept and it's not his fault. He just doesn't, you know, and it's, it's hard. That's the other thing too, I think is just, you learn like we all do when we're dealing with kids in general, but when we're dealing with people with special needs is you learn infinite patience or hopefully you learn infinite patience. You know, it's harder sometimes than others, but you know, it's just the understanding that even though things that, that he's doing that may seem defiant or may seem like he's just picking on you you know he's just doing things to to get a rise out of you it it are things that he just has no control over and so to remind yourself of that in the heat of the moment and react appropriately is is not always the easiest thing in the world and and you know we all we all struggle with those things sometimes and it's unfortunate but you know we get better yeah well thanks for your authenticity uh, has there been some meaningful advice that you've gotten along the way as far as raising a child with Angelman? Our, uh, our two very, very active organizations, um, advocacy organizations and organizations that help to fundraise for uh, drug trials and things like that as well. One of them is uh, Angelman Syndrome Foundation, ASF. The other one is the acronym is FAST. It's Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics. And FAST at that point was holding a, a information seminar and as, as it became referred to as adult prom every year in Chicago, 
And two months after uh, Kristen and I uh, started living together and I was seeing him every day, they had one of those in Chicago in December. And so I went with her and got a chance to meet a lot of people that she met through those seminars and online. And just to see other kids, you know, there were people that would bring their kids. So you'd see other kids, you'd see older kids and see how they behave. You'd see younger kids and just to see the difference in how the behavior was. And then to talk to the other parents, you know, I didn't know anybody in, in that world and to get to meet so many other parents from all over, not just this country, but all over the world who had come to learn about what was going on, to learn the science, to learn, you know, what was happening with drug trials. And then just kind of get together and cut loose for an evening. It was incredibly helpful and still is, you know, all the, all these years later to know that there was a community out there with both organizations, um, ASF especially now, where if you need something, if you have questions about something, you can reach out to somebody or you can post something on uh, a Facebook page and somebody has gone through that at some point. And just the the wealth of experience and the willingness of people to share that with others has been incredible and nothing that I would have anticipated was out there for something that is, you know, it's, it's affects one in 15 to 20,000. So uh, just the fact that you've got this condition that's so uncommon, but you've got so many people who are willing and able to share their their knowledge and their information and their insight is is pretty amazing. Yeah, well, it does sound like a blessing to be uh, able to connect with other parents and have that resource, right? So you're not trying to figure out things on your own and don't feel as isolated as you might otherwise. When I think about uh, rare disease like Angelman's, you know, it doesn't affect that many people, one out of 20,000 or whatever the number is. We're so much better off today in the information age where that information is at your fingertips and you can be in contact with people, like you said, not just locally, but you know, virtually anywhere around the country, around the world, uh, versus what it would have been 20 years ago. Pre-iPhone, pre-Google this, Google that, right? You know, it was a, a much more daunting uh, task. And that's not to say that it's easy, right? I'm not trying to candy coat something, but you know, if you can put the time frame in perspective, you know, what a blessing it is to have all this information, these connections, literally at your fingertips. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, the more you want to seek it out, the more you can find, you know, you can dig as deep as you need to. And you can find people who are um, who are experts on this and who can give you the information that you need and are willing to do so. You know, we do we do have friends who have kids who and I call them kids um, who are in their 20s and 30s. And it's exactly that, you know, they went through even Kristen when Bowie was first diagnosed, you know, that would have been 13 years ago. There was not the, the information or the availability of the information was not there like it is now. So it's just it leaps and bounds, even in even in the six years, six and a half years that that I've lived it. It's much more prevalent and it's much more easy to find that information than it used to be. And I don't know what I would have done in my situation without having those resources. I can't imagine being a parent 15 years ago and, and having getting the diagnosis and, and just not even knowing where to go or what to do. Absolutely. So I'm sort of curious to know what impact has Bowie's situation had on Ada, your marriage or the extended family for that matter? It's been different. It's definitely been different on my family, especially, you know, my family has been incredibly accepting and, and I knew they would be, I mean, my family's I'm, I'm lucky to have the family that I do and they've, they've been very welcoming. They're very patient with him. They've been very accepting of the situation and Ada deals with, you know, she's a 17 year old girl and she's got her own things, but she's very patient with him. She deals very well with him. They're in the same school together. He is in her senior year. Bowie's a sophomore. They're in the same school. They see each other. They both are in chorus. And so she sees him every day and she sees him differently. And her friends see him and she never acts like embarrassed to have him as her brother or tries to ignore him or anything else. You know, they know him, they know her, they know what he's like. And, you know, she just kind of laughs it off and, and just keeps plowing through. As far as the marriage, you know, 
my I tell my wife she's the strongest tiny person I've ever met, and I don't mean that just physically because of having to, <laughs> you know, get and move him around, but also just you know she's just mentally she's dealt with so much, and she continues to do it with you know it's not always easy, and you have your breakdown sometimes, but she goes through it every day like a champ and is is as supportive and loving and helpful to him as as he needs her to be and it's it's incredible it's incredible to see that i I never have a doubt for one second that i made the right choice with the family and with her yeah well thanks for uh, mentioning that Uh, you did come into the relationship right so it takes a special type of uh, person dad to uh, come into a stepfather relationship knowing that there's a, a child with uh, special needs. So I admire you from that perspective. And it sounds like, if I can paraphrase what you were saying about Ada and about Kristen, these are some really strong women. They're rock solid. And uh, you guys are getting something right. Even though I'm sure I'm reading between the lines, there's challenges on a day-to-day basis. You know, you have to be able to look back every once in a while and say, yeah, we might not be on top of our game 100% of the time, but uh, you're, you're raising some really fine human beings. So I'd like to switch gears and talk about special needs beyond your own um, family experience. I'm sort of curious to know, how did you get involved with Parent to Parent and what what does Parent to Parent do? I started working with Parent to Parent almost four years ago. It's tough for a lot of dads, um, as as you know, and as you know, most of, of your guests in, in the past, I'm sure I've attested, it's hard because we're guys to necessarily find another guy that says, you know, they get it. So as part of what I do, we started a support group online. It's every two weeks. And it's just guys who, you know, they might get on because they want to talk about some milestone that their kid hit or they're feeling down because something happened and they were are looking for some encouragement or they're having a hard time getting a certain service through the state. Does anybody know who they can go to? anybody have any resources, just things like that. Or it could just be, you know, has your kid ever done this? What do you do when that happens? So there's a lot of information sharing. There's a lot of, you know, it's just, it's whatever they want to talk about, which is really nice. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's been successful is we've created a format where you can come on and say as much or as little as you want to, and you can ask questions or you can sit back and listen and you can interject when you want to. But we're not pushing anything and we're not requiring anything from anybody, you know, people don't have to participate if they don't want to. It's just getting to a comfort level to where you feel like you belong and just you're comfortable with, with the group. And so we don't get too many people who come on and and don't participate. And if they do, it's for, you know, the first half hour that they're on. And then usually they'll have a question or they'll have something to interject. And a lot of the ones who have come on and say, well, I didn't want to do this because I was afraid it was going to be touchy feely and, and therapy and everything else, uh, end up being the ones who tell us after their first time that they got so much out of it. It was so great. Um, it's not what they expected at all. And we'll see you in two weeks. It's great. You know, it's, it's nice to see that satisfaction. It's nice to know that you're, what you're doing is having a, a positive impact on people. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for talking about the uh, father engagement work that Parent to Parent does. So I'm thinking about advice now, and I'm wondering um, if there's any advice that uh, you'd like to share. I think just being open, you know, being open and accepting to the fact that just because your journey and your path as a father is not necessarily what you had thought it would be doesn't mean that it can't be incredibly gratifying and satisfying. It's different things, you know, with, with our kids in a lot of ways, we learn, I think we learn to appreciate baby steps. The first time a a neurotypical kid walks, it's, it's a milestone. It's amazing. But if you have a kid who's not mobile and they walk for the first time at four and they were maybe told by their doctor, they were never going to walk. 
that's just so much more of a of a, a an achievement that it's hard to really wrap your head around that you know somebody told you you were never going to be able to do something and now you're doing it that that's that's amazing and just to, i guess just having that perspective of not every celebration has to be a huge one you know learn to celebrate the small things learn to celebrate the smaller milestones and you'll you'll get just as much gratification and satisfaction out of that that's great advice so i'm sort of curious to know why is it you agreed to be a mentor father as part of the special fathers network i feel like i have a unique perspective almost an outsider perspective because when i did come into my marriage and being a stepdad i knew sort of what was going on. I, I came into it with my eyes open. There was no surprise diagnosis. I knew what was there. That's all given me a little bit different perspective in terms of looking at the research, trying to find out as much as I can about things, try, you know, struggling with finding information and, and finding out as much, uh, as many details and as much about the diagnosis as I can. Having gone through that, I feel like I can help others who might be struggling with the same difficulty, whether in my circumstance or not, just to know that there's information out there, there's resources out there, there's other dads out there. Find your group, find your network, find the people who get it and to help them do that, whether it's, you know, with me, whether it's with, you know, through parent to parent in New York state or whether it's in a, in a larger context, just being there and being available for people in a way that there were so many people that were available there for me when I needed them. Yeah, well, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for being part of the network. Uh, let's give a special shout out to uh, Luis Mendoza, formerly the executive director at the Washington State Fathers Network for helping connect us. Absolutely. If somebody wants to learn more about Parent to Parent or contact you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, they can go on our website. It is www.parenttoparentnys. Org. We'll be sure to include that and information about uh, the ASF and FAST as well in the show notes. Chris, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Chris is just one of the dads who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concern. Would you please consider making a tax-deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Chris, thanks again. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to facebook.com groups and search dad to dad. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.